and welcome back to the Phoenix Concussion Recovery Podcast. Uh, we're here with Nick Mercer, Concussion Talk Podcast. Uh, my name is Lauren Zayax. I'm a physical therapist. I specialize in concussions. I work at a major hospital network in the United States, and uh, 100% of my practice is in the treatment of people with mild traumatic brain injuries. Uh, I specialize in vision and vestibular therapy, and we're also building protocols for primitive reflex integration. So that is my background. Thanks for having me today, Nick. Oh, well, no, thanks for having me because it's your podcast. So <laughs> don't go nuts. We're going to talk about this on a this, this anomia. That's right. So and, episode and 10 today, if you can believe it's been 10 times that 10 you've times. gotten me to do one of these. More than that. More, it's been like <laughs> about 11 times now because I had you on before you were, before you were finishing question when you were just, just playing a Lauren's axe. <laughs> it was just plain old me. You weren't even you weren't the, you weren't the fancy concussion then. Now <laughs> now you're now you're now you're this, so 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 today we're gonna talk about dysautonomia, which is an up and coming diagnosis that is associated with concussion. So dysautonomia is a term that is being used now to describe the deregulation of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is that part of our brainstem function that controls things like temperature. Am I hot? Am I cold? It regulates our blood pressure and our heart rate. So how fast does my heart rate need to beat in order to maintain that normal homeostasis with my blood pressure? It controls our vital functions that we don't even have to think about. So the things like our breathing, our thirst, our hunger, again, our temperature regulation, our sleep. So our autonomic nervous system is constantly working, and it's strongly affected by that fight-or-flight response as well. So dysautonomia has been around for a long time. You'll have seen it under a lot of different terms. They are now classifying dysautonomia as an umbrella term. So there's 16 different types. We're going to focus primarily on the people who have had a concussion, and that's why they have dysautonomia, versus the people with POTS and, and a variety of different things. Is that, Dysauton- so, is oh, that always, does a concussion always cause dysautonomia? No, and, and we and don't also, know. What, and also, what is POTS? Got it. Okay. So, uh, good question. So, dysautonomia is not always caused um, by concussion. So, not every person who has a concussion is going to have dysautonomia, but it's going to be those people with a concussion who have some weird symptoms, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, I don't know what the incidence rate is because we're only just starting to identify it. So, the, the CDC estimates that about 70 million people have dysautonomia in one of those 16 patterns in the U.S. However, that number is probably much higher because we just haven't been good at identifying it up until in the right. last year or so. You're starting to see articles published for head injuries and dysautonomia. We're now starting to identify in the clinic. Now treatments are being developed. So I think it's actually a much bigger problem than we really realize, but okay. we just don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Right. And then POTS is a completely different type of autonomic right. nervous system deregulation, and I do not in any way specialize in POTS. Oh, um, yeah. There are specialty clinics. They are very hard to find, but it's those people who um, will have fainting episodes, or they're just standing perfectly still, and their blood pressure will actually drop, and okay. so they get really lightheaded. And there's a whole treatment protocol just for POTS, and we could probably talk about that in another episode, or I could even have one of our other specialists that works at the hospital with me come on and talk about POTS because she's done some training in it. Okay. Um, but I would just refer to her if I had someone that I suspected and had does, does it POTS. Stand, does it stand for something, or is that just short somebody's name? It or? does, Nick, and I don't want <laughs> you to do that to me. Okay, it's, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> Postural. A, I can't remember. Well, I cannot remember. I'll, I'll Google it. I'll do postural. I'm not okay. good at acronyms. I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. One second. You keep talking. I'll find pots. But, uh, but yeah, so the, as you can see, I, I'm well aware of where my limitations are and where I need to refer out. Um, and so we talked about a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. You have to understand the autonomic nervous system in order to understand how it becomes deregulated or dysregulated. Uh, and it can happen for a primary uh, for a couple of different reasons. So there's primary dysautonomia, which could be inherited. So you could thank your parents that you have it. It could also be due to a degenerative disease. So a primary condition would be that that is it's its own little animal, right? It's not because of something else that that is the condition. Or it could be secondary too. So you could develop dysautonomia because of another condition or injury. So it's a symptom of a bigger problem. And that's the bucket that I would put the people who have dysautonomia from a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury or a more severe brain injury. I just don't see as many of those. 
Um, on, on, autoimmune diseases can cause dysautonomia, so people with celiac disease, Crohn's, people who have neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease, um, people with other types of autoimmune disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is people who have a disorder of their connective tissue. So those types of people are uh, the, the ones who are more likely in general to develop dysautonomia. And I believe I saw a hand raise. So what do you got, Nick? I got POTS. I don't have, <laughs> you know, I have the, the term. Postural <laughs> orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. There you go. Yeah. So you stand up, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure drops, and you get really lightheaded and you feel like you're going to pass out or maybe you do pass out and you have fainting spells. Right. So it can be quite debilitating for these people, but once they get moving, their system usually kicks in. And like I said, there's a whole treatment protocol where you actually would start lying supine or on your back and moving just your legs. So you have to regulate your heart rate in a really low way to start to rebuild your system when you have POTS. Right. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. So, so we got so that sorted getting, out now. <laughs> we'll get back into the autoimmune disorders yes. and other causes. Um, what's also interesting about dysautonomia outside of concussion, because again, 70 million people, so we know that it's a lot of people other than just our patient population. Um, overall deconditioning, so from orthopedic injuries, people with chronic pain, people with back injuries, so people who simply cannot exercise for a period of time can develop dysautonomia because you're not using that system regularly and we start to actually have dysfunctional patterns. It could also come from depression and anxiety and when we get into the symptoms of dysautonomia, you're going to see that it blends very closely with all of these other types of conditions and it can be really hard to tease out what person fits into what bucket or do you actually dabble in multiple buckets and we have to use multiple modalities to treat you properly and right. we don't want to miss any piece. So we don't want to treat you for dysautonomia when you really have anxiety, but we don't want to be treating you for anxiety when dysautonomia is the root cause. You yeah. need to be treated. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So what a patient would look like and, and the reason that we, um, we last minute changed to, to episode 10 to dysautonomia from what we were going to talk about. I gotta uh, fix my, gotta fix my, gotta fix my <laughs> blog post now. <laughs> uh, my, my my good friend who has also been a patient in the past told me uh, today I was saying I, I've been searching for something exciting to talk about and um, she says well why don't you just talk about me so we're going to call her Sarah and uh, <laughs> Sarah <laughs> is somebody who um, we've been treating for dysautonomia in addition to the concussion a history of autoimmune disorders right and so we know that these people who have these autoimmune disorders are more likely to have dysautonomia so she sort of fit this perfect puzzle right. Right. And so these people come into the clinic and they say things like, you know, never mind the dizziness because we'll talk about that in a second, but that could have a plethora of reasons that people with a head injury are dizzy, right? I'm, I'm noticing that when I try to exercise, my breathing gets weird or sometimes I'm moving around and I feel like my heart is skipping a beat or I'm cold all the time now and I can't figure out why. I've gained 20 pounds since my concussion, but I haven't really changed anything other than I'm not exercising, but it's not like I'm eating a lot more because I'm not really hungry. Um, dysautonomia can cause a uh, weight loss or you can have a weight gain. It could be um, a loss of appetite. And so these people might come in and they say, since my head injury, I've had this, I've lost 30 pounds in the last year and I can't tell why because I haven't been exercising more. Um, I had another patient who said, and this was someone I was I was very concerned about the dysautonomia, and we're going to talk about those challenges. But it's actually really hard to get that diagnosed by an endocrinologist. Um, but we, this patient came in and he says, you know, I, I used to drink a bud every night when I got home, right? I, I was a bud heavy drinker every night, but I didn't drink that many, and I haven't drank since my concussion. But I've lost thirty pounds, and that seems weird. I can't imagine yeah. one changing one bud heavy every night is yeah. going to make me lose thirty pounds. And then he started talking about his frequent urination in the middle of the night. And then he started talking about, yeah, you know, I'm cold all the time at work. And my brain just starts to go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. This is this is endocrine function. This is autonomic mm. nervous system. We have this whole list of things I need to work on. Yeah. But my job is to identify and refer. And now we have the Buffalo treadmill test. So now I do have something that I can use to help identify while I wait three months to get somebody in with an endocrinologist. So the, sorry, the Buffalo treadmill test is what the is... It's a, it's, a, it's a tool now that we're using in concussion to diagnose 
heart rate zones that we should be using to exercise. And then it's okay. also something that we're using as a form of treatment. And we're going to talk about that at the very end when we talk about um, how are we going to fix these things. Okay. But but typically people with dysautonomia, what, what, we'll regu- what we'll notice is they'll also have some endocrine function issues. So I send them, I used to send them to an endocrinologist because they could run a blood panel or maybe a good you know, concussion doctor can run a blood panel and we can look for cortisol levels that are off. We can look for growth hormone that's off. We can look for testosterone levels in men that are off. And these all sort of start to fit together. For this person, luckily, um, with the weight loss, we had him start exercising every single day with this Buffalo treadmill test protocol. At, At the time, it was a modified protocol from that test. And by the time they got in with the endocrinologist three months later, they were starting to put on weight again. They were sleeping regularly. So the endocrinologist says, why would you send this person to me? They're fine. Yeah. (laughs) That was because we were able to fix the problem before they even got in with the specialist. Yeah. Um, For Sarah, it was, uh, I think that's why I decided to call her Sarah. Um, (laughs) She comes in and she's got this temperature issue. She's had this weight gain. She's having more mood swings, more issues with depression. She can't figure out why is, which pieces go into which bucket. And so I said, you know, with your history of autoimmune disorders, and since you're going back to your neurologist here in the next month, can you talk to them about what are the chances that you're presenting with this new term, this dysautonomia? And then what are their medical inputs? I know from my perspective what we're going to do to treat it but can you have them look into it further medically can you have them make sure your blood panels are looking good can you have them make sure that your autoimmune system is working your thyroid is regulating properly it becomes a bigger complex medical issue so i as a physical therapist can't operate in a silo and treat this injury by myself right 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 so we've got people with dizziness with postural changes positional changes like i go to stand up and i get dizzy We've got people who might feel like their heart is pounding or it's skipping. They've got lightheadedness and dizziness with standing. So I'm standing perfectly still. I was watching my husband hang a mirror on the wall, and all of a sudden I got dizzy out of nowhere. Yeah. It could be that. It could be visual disturbances. I go to stand up and I get blurry vision. It could be that they're having breathing difficulties, particularly with exercise. I do better if I'm having a conversation with my friend because that helps regulate my breathing. Right. Because now I'm having to, if I'm talking, I'm breathing, right? If air is yeah. going out, air is coming in. And and so they'll tell you these sort of telltale signs. I'm having sleep issues. I'm having mood swings. Well, I'm having mood swings also because my autonomic <laughs> nervous system is yeah. regulating yeah. itself. I'm hot and I'm cold and I'm disoriented and I'm dizzy and, and I am not sleeping down, at yeah. night. So yeah. it's, it becomes this whole chicken or the egg complicated situation. Yeah. And it overlaps with the vestibular issues, right? I could also be dizzy with standing. I could also be dizzy with sitting up in bed because I have an inner ear problem. It overlaps with vision problems because I could also have visual disturbances when I turn my head because of my inner ear and my eyes not working together properly. I could also have mood swings because I have a chemical cascade in my brain from my head injury. So you can't just automatically label someone with dysautonomia and walk away from the rest of their problems. It just should be a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So are we good on what dysautonomia is? Yeah, I am. At least. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully right. the listeners are too. Hopefully. Or we just <laughs> talked in circles. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> so... What's also really interesting, and um, as an athletic trainer, I'm required to do these evidence-based uh, continuing ed units, and so you kind of have to take whatever is available. And so I did a couple I – I happened to just pick dysfunctional breathing because we see a lot of that in my patient population. So I said, I'll get my hours, and I'll read about – I'll learn about this dysfunctional breathing. And as the woman was talking, you know, she wasn't talking about concussion specifically, but as she was talking about dysfunctional breathing as a bigger disorder, just like dysautonomia is a bigger disorder uh, that impacts people with concussion, I started realizing how much that overlies with dysautonomia. And, yeah. and again, it's a chicken or the egg. Do you yeah. have dysautonomia because you have dysfunctional breathing from your injury? Or did you develop dysfunctional breathing because you're... you had dysautonomia? Right. <laughs> right? So dysfunctional breathing is not sleep apnea. It, it could be associated with sleep apnea, but it's not the same thing. We can have lots of different breathing disorders. Um, dysfunctional breathing can be a symptom or a cause of an issue, and it can occur from the trauma in and of itself. So people who develop dysfunctional breathing usually have a history of some sort of trauma, whether it's anxiety and depression or an orthopedic, a skeletal issue that has occurred, and it causes their body to no longer descend the diaphragm the way it's supposed to in our cavity. So what should happen when we breathe is I take a breath in, and then my diaphragm goes down towards my belly, 
and that makes my belly go out. So our belly should go out when we breathe in. We shouldn't be sucking it in all the time trying to look skinny in all of our clothes. Yeah. And uh, and so our belly bill, our belly goes out, and the pressure in our abdomen also increases. So we build intra-abdominal pressure when we breathe in, which supports our spine. It actually massages our organs. It keeps our colon moving properly. So all kinds of things happen just because of the natural thing that we do every single day called breathing. A lot of that's why, that's why yoga loves us so much, I guess, eh? Yes, like your mom, yeah. who was just raising you, yes. is a big yogi, so. Big yogi. She's like, Lauren, we're going to do some breathing patterns yeah. today. And I was like, <laughs> cool, cool. I probably need to do that since I ride on the anxiety line, but like, yeah, come on yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, so dysfunctional breathing, you can correct with things like that yoga breathing. And we're going to go through a um, breathing cycle here at the end. So you're asking me awesome questions. Um, so dysfunctional breathing can lead to deconditioning and a fear of exercise, right? And that could be because you're in chronic pain. So you're afraid of moving because your brain has decided movement equals pain. And there are tons of amazing podcasts about chronic pain um, from people much more specialized than myself. And then you can also um, be afraid to exercise because your dysfunctional breathing makes you feel crummy. You're not getting the right amount of oxygen, so you're dizzy afterwards or lightheaded or disoriented. And so you end up not exercising and you get deconditioned for that reason. And then once you're deconditioned, you could develop dysautonomia. Right. Or you could have dysautonomia, which causes dysregulation of your breathing and is a portion of why you can't exercise. Right. So they really go together. And that was what was fascinating for me when I was um, listening to these continuing ed units because I was like, this is not what she's talking about, but this is where my brain keeps perseverating back to because that's what I specialize in yeah, yeah. And, and how these things impact each other. So so the diaphragm should go down. We should build intra-abdominal pressure. We should be massaging our organs and um, we should be supporting our spine. And then on the exhalation, the diaphragm should passively recoil back up and just think about like where your rib line is. That's where the diaphragm should go back up into. And there's all kinds of muscles that support each other. Um, and we could maybe even do a whole podcast just on, on breathing breathing but um the diaphragm goes back up and then it should come back down again and so it should be this constant ebb and flow of the diaphragm going up and down up and down massaging our organs stretching our fascial onesie and getting our muscles to, to activate fascial the proper onesie? way oh, gotcha. fascial onesie gotcha. I, I know i know when, as soon as i say i know what i mean I had a teacher once in school, Adam Thomas, give you a shout out, you're the bomb. <laughs> um, he, he talked when he was teaching us about your fascia, your the, the outer light, like when you, if you have a piece of chicken that you got from the grocery store and it's got that white film on it that I used to pull off all the time because it grossed me out, yeah. that would be the fascia that coats over the muscle. So yeah. we all have a fascial onesie and that's why you'll see in these chronic pain um, workshops and things like that like my ankle pain is related to my low back and, and different things because not neurologically but because that fascia can get trapped in one spot and it makes it harder for another body part to move and so he put up a picture of himself in a um, bright red, red onesie and called it your fascial onesie and i have forever remembered that's, that's good actually <laughs> your fascia is all connected <laughs> So anyway, your your diaphragm going down and up should be massaging your fascial Massaging <laughs> onesie, that's good. That's good, that's good and, this, and those adhesions can make it so that your diaphragm actually becomes flattened and elevated and it no longer descends. And so dysfunctional breathing is a, a lot of things, but the one that we're going to talk about is a more classic sense of it. Um, it's those barrel chested people will often, um, those are the easiest ones to spot on earth with dysfunctional breathing. So it's those people with that sort of more rounded, broader chest. When you look at yourself and you touch that bottom part of your sternum, so where that chest bone ends, and then you can feel where your ribs come out on a diagonal line, you should have a 90 degree angle between your left rib cage and your right rib cage where it hinges on the bottom of that sternum. Right. Yeah. So a normal person with normal breathing is going to have a 90 degree angle and you could have a smaller angle, but most people are going to have a bigger angle or sort of a flail chest or a barrel chest. Yeah. And these are the people where they lay down flat and you see their ribs pop way out. Even if they're not that skinny, right. yeah. you see their ribs come, come way out and they flail out. 
Yeah. And so what happens there is they don't have the muscle tension and the tone and the fascial tension to keep their ribs down and to support their spine. And so if they try to do abdominal exercises with their back like that, they're actually putting a ton of pressure on their low back. They're not firing their abdominal muscles, their corset muscles the right way. And so now we're doing any type of exercise from a very unstable base. Great. And so that's the problem with dysfunctional breathing is our breathing should give us a strong base to move our limbs from. So we should have a strong postural control because of this diaphragm descending and ascending the proper way, giving us stability in our spine. And now I can move my limbs properly because I have a stable core. If we don't have that, we can have back pain. We can have fear avoidance behavior. There's actually studies where people come in with a loss of shoulder internal rotation where your shoulder goes down and in, or like if you're trying to reach up your back. And when you correct this dysfunctional breathing, without even touching their shoulder, their shoulder range of motion will improve because they have a better stability. Right, okay. So we we talked about that costal angle. So this is like an easy way to see somebody who's got dysfunctional breathing. That diaphragm doesn't descend. They don't build the pressure. They're not getting the right amount of oxygen exchange. They're not getting oxygen in that lower part of their lungs. They don't have that natural support. They don't have that stable base. And so getting this evaluated by a specialist can be crucial. I can muddle my way through the basics. If someone's got a really low case, I can lead you through a breathing pattern. I can tell you, go home and listen to this this specific podcast about this or that. Um, But if somebody needs a specialist, I've got other people on my team at the hospital that I work at that will lead them through more advanced techniques. And there's actually manual therapy techniques where um, in the in the continuing ed that I was looking at, they were actually using Graston tools or those metal tools to release some of those fascial adhesions so that the diaphragm could descend properly. Are they, are they rolling pins or like that type of tool? Are they, are they the two, yeah, is that like, is that like kind of with the, is that what you mean about it, those Graston tools or? Graston tools, if you're going to use the term Graston, you have to be specifically trained by the Graston method or you can use instrument assisted um, manual therapy. So uh, yeah. you can have any type of metal 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 tools now. There's tons of companies that make them. And you want to be trained in them. You want to be, you know, a skilled physical therapist or an athletic trainer that's using these tools. But there's different ways that you actually use them and you, and you rub them on the skin to get those lower levels to release or to cause a chemical change in those tissues to bring an inflammatory response and get them to heal themselves. It just depends on which school of thought you believe, you, what you believe you're doing with the tools based on your oh. training. Okay. And so you would go to a specialist for something like that. Your average physical therapist is not going to, or physio is not going to, um, going to be able to give you a specialized treatment in that because most of us don't deal with it on a daily basis. Although right. based on the numbers, most of us should be, are dealing with it on a daily basis. Yeah. We just don't know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so anyway, um, we want to recognize this and we want to refer to someone on. And so dysfunctional breathing, again, could be its own thing. I, I watched a four-hour continuing ed unit on it. So obviously 10 minutes on the podcast isn't going to be enough. But just so people know that these things go together and you have to treat both and you have to look for all these different pieces. So we'll talk about how to correct dysfunctional breathing on a high level first and then we'll finish up with the Buffalo treadmill test for dysautonomia. All right. So for dysfunctional breathing, one of the biggest things that they talked about in this continuing ed course was getting the patient to be aware of their dysfunctional breathing. So most of us are not aware that we're breathing mostly in our upper chest or that our our throat is actually constricting while we try to breathe. And so having the patient lay completely flat because you want to start in the lowest position possible and you actually just put your hand on your belly and your hand on your upper chest and you breathe in and you should feel your hand on your lower belly expand first. So a dysfunctional breathing method would be that the person will actually feel their hand on the top of their chest expand first and then maybe they get just a little bit of air into that lower hand. And so you actually want to teach that person to not feel hardly any movement in their upper hand and you want to teach them to feel all the movement in the lower hand and then after I fully fill my belly I should feel my upper hand moves. So my lower belly hand should go up first and then if I take a full inhalation, my upper hand should move. And then as I exhale, and through my pursed lips, I should feel my chest fall back down and I should feel my belly go all the way back in and my belly button might even push in towards my spine if I get a little bit of abdominal firing and that pushes all that air back out. And that's why you'll hear a lot, especially in yoga, that the exhale should be longer than the inhale. 
because you want to push all that right. air back out, empty thoroughly so that you get all new fresh air back in and you get that recoil. So if I push all the way out on my exhale, I'm naturally going to refill back up because gravity is going to pull that abdominal back, uh, that diaphragm back down. So I'm actively exhaling, pushing out. It's kind of like a vacuum almost. Yeah, you create a vacuum. Yeah, yeah. So when you're breathing properly, it should become very passive, right? When I'm breathing improperly, it's a very active process. You'll hear people kind of have a shudder to their breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You can hear the muscles going. You can hear yeah, that raspy yeah. quality of their air. But when I'm breathing properly, I'm getting that push-pull, and I'm getting that passive, active, uh, passive motion to my breathing. And that's proper breathing. So that would be the first thing. And then you could go to sitting, and then you could go to standing, and then you would do the same thing doing functional things. Okay, I want you to do a lunge with your hands in those positions, and I want you to feel your belly yeah. still moving properly as you do your lunge. I yeah. want you to fire your core and core exercises, right? I want you to use that those corset muscles, but I also want your belly to still be able to go up and down. Because right. people will cheat in core, and they'll actually keep their diaphragm down. They'll, they'll hold that pressure, and they won't continue to do that proper breathing pattern because they're going to cheat to build more pressure to support their spine because their core isn't strong enough to support their spine. Right. So we want to teach them to be able to do functional things, but if you can't do it lying flat, you certainly can't do it doing your lunge, right? Yeah, so exactly. you have to build over time doing yeah. those things. And then the other thing that you can do is lead people through breathing cycles. So I, I've been a big, um, I love the Calm app. The Calm app actually has the little circle. The only problem with the Calm app is it doesn't do the holds, although that's really challenging for people in the beginning. Because if you have dysfunctional breathing, doing a full proper breathing cycle is actually going to make you maybe lightheaded. You're going to yeah. feel like your heart starts to race, right? Because yeah. your, your brain is like, your autonomic system is like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? I need oxygen constantly because I'm really an inefficient breather. Yeah. And so you breathe in through your nose. You feel your belly expand in the lower lungs. You feel that bottom hand lift. You feel finally the chest rise just a little bit. You hold for a count of three before you let it, let it out. And then you breathe out through those pursed lips to build that pressure. And then you have their belly button come all the way into your spine. You feel those abdominals engage. And then you hold out for a count of three. And then you breathe back in because you create that vacuum by holding out for that count of three. So you can go through breathing cycles and you can also use your tactile cues of having your hands on your chest and your belly to feel yourself breathing properly. And you right. do that passively and then you move into functional tasks trying to do the same thing. Gotcha. That's, yeah, okay. was, I know like, doing you, when you push out, you really feel the vacuum. When you exhale, hold for three at the end of the exhale, you really feel the vacuum kind of come into play. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want to work on this dysfunctional breathing pattern with our patients with dysautonomia because if our heart rate isn't regulating properly, if our blood pressure isn't regulating properly, if we're not breathing properly, we're going to have dysfunctional breathing. It's going to be a symptom of our dysautonomia. And so we want to, we want to fix all these things. And so the Buffalo treadmill test was not created to identify dysautonomia in my understanding, I think it was sort of a, a nice little happenstance. Buffalo treadmill test was, um, it's a modified bulky treadmill test. It comes from Buffalo, um, some amazing group out of Buffalo did a bunch of research on this. And they were able to identify an exercise test that you could do with people with concussions safely early on in their recovery. I can't put you on a treadmill and make you run. You have a concussion. Running is not allowed in the beginning, right? We have right. to build to running. So how am I going to track how your heart rate is responding? And so um, we had made it a mission to be better about using the Buffalo treadmill test versus historically I've told people, I want you to exercise at a 5 out of 10 effort. Now I would say 99% of the time, that instruction, I want you to exercise at a 5 out of 10 effort, they fall into what the results will be from the Buffalo treadmill test. But I've also found that, and, and to me, doing the test itself just to get the information, it was taking 20 minutes out of something else that I felt was more valuable in my treatment session. But patients weren't doing it. They weren't doing the exercise because they, didn't, they weren't buying in. And so now that we've started using the Buffalo treadmill test and you show the patient, this is how your heart rate responded. This would be a normal response. This is why I want you to exercise at that 5 out of 10 effort. Or here's the heart rate number if you're able to monitor your heart rate on your own. Now people... Um, now people are more likely to be adherent with the treatment protocol. So you put them on the uh, treadmill test. 
you start them, it's, it's a walking test and you actually increase the incline to increase the severity of the exercise. And what normally would happen if we didn't have dysautonomia is that our heart rate will continue to increase as the workload goes up because I need more oxygen, right? So I have to pump my heart faster to feed all of my organs and my muscles. And so my heart rate should go up. And so in the true Buffalo treadmill test, you're supposed to stop the test when their symptoms, headache, dizziness, nausea, increase by a three out of 10. So if I started at a two out of 10 headache on the test, if I got to a five, that's where I would stop. And I would collect my heart rate at that time and I would prescribe 80% of that heart rate to the patient. So every day I want you to exercise at 102 beats per minute. And it's going to be low like that. And people are going to be like, that's yeah. not exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to say, for your brain, it is. Yeah. Because that's when that blood flow starts to come away from your brain and you became symptomatic. Right. But in doing this test, what we've realized is that people's heart rate will actually start to plummet. So normal, I increase your workload, your heart rate goes up. But in people with dysautonomia, what will happen is their heart rate will actually plateau. I'm increasing the workload, I'm increasing the workload, I'm increasing the workload. And they're mm -hmm. hovering, they're at 120, 120, 122, 118, yeah. 124. And it's not really moving, but they're telling me their effort level is going up. Well, now their autonomic system is no longer pumping more blood right? They're, they're okay. no longer getting what they need. They've stopped. They're, they've halted at one level. So now we're stopping the test there because at that point you're no longer regulating. So why would I continue the test just to make you feel crummy in an hour, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. And, so we've well, added otherwise. extra criteria to our test because now we're starting to realize how prevalent this dysautonomia is because we're starting to watch what's happening with the heart rate because you collect the heart rate every single minute. You also ask them about their symptoms and you ask them about their effort level. And what we're, so we're finding that the heart rate will actually plateau and we're finding that the heart rate will plummet. So we go up a workload, we go up to 10% incline on the treadmill and they go from 130 beats per minute to 90 beats per minute. And then they hang there for maybe a stage or two and then they go back up. And so we're starting to call it, we're starting to call their workload at the number they hit before their heart rate plummeted. Because as soon as your heart rate plummets during exercise, that's not normal. That, that, that's dysautonomia, yeah. no longer a regulated heart rate, right? My, my autonomic nervous system is no longer regulating itself. And so we take the 80% of that number where they start to show signs that their, their system is no longer regulating itself, and you prescribe them 80% of that max heart rate, not of their estimated max heart rate, but of that max heart rate on the test, and they do that every day, and what they actually start to do is they start to respond better to exercise. They start to tell, come in the clinic and say, you know what, I notice I'm not getting cold all the time anymore. Hey, you know what, my appetite is back. Hey, you know what, I'm sleeping better. Hey, yeah. you know what, I'm, you know, I'm feeling like my anxiety is getting under control because I'm able to exercise now and I don't feel crummy afterwards. And so you want to restore that autonomic nervous system function medically with your doctors, if there's any sort of testosterone levels off or growth hormones or cortisol levels off. And then physically, the best treatment that we have right now is this daily exercise in a very contained environment where we're giving you a heart rate to stay in for that full 20 minutes. We're not even really doing interval training in the beginning. We're just saying, I want you to get to 102 beats per minute for 20 minutes. Go for a walk, ride a stationary bike. If you can tolerate an elliptical, no running. You can walk at an incline. And then we want to stay there, and when I have them add five beats per minute, as they start to feel more and more tolerable. And then we'll redo the test and see what their new target heart rate zone is. Okay, add five beats per minute as tolerated until I see you again, until we can get back to a normal age-expected heart rate max, which is that 220 minus your age. So you want to work on your breathing. You want to work on your physical exercise. You want to make sure you don't have any hormone dysregulation going on. And this is a really common secondary cause from a, from a head injury. So it's be, in this specific population, not in dysautonomia in general, but in this specific population, it is a symptom of your head injury and your body not regulating itself. And it can cause this underlying issue where you're doing all these treatments and you can't figure out why you can't fix these things. And if we just did that daily exercise boom, we can trick that piece and then we can get everything to come together and get you better. So nice. that's dysautonomia in a nutshell. Well, in a nutshell is a great, great, great description and explanation of all the stuff. So that's a, that's a pretty long one for us, I guess. But, uh, Sorry about that, guys. Oh, I not, got a little left of myself uh, there. It's interesting, though, isn't it? It's fascinating stuff. And dis, dysautonomia, I can definitely know how to say it now. Probably. You got it now. We're, so we're now, now we're down, now. yeah, on fire. 
All right. So, uh, so thank yeah. you guys so much. You can find me on Twitter at LZ Concussion. Uh, you can find us on phoenixconcussionrecovery.com. And then there's lots of information building out there. So if you're confused about any of it, um, go to your doctor and talk to them or your physical therapist. And if they don't know, strongly recommend that they do some research and they look into some of the articles so that they can help you. The treatments are not that challenging. It's just that we as professionals need to do the legwork to understand what we're treating. Great. That's a- well, it's well, up to you to thank you, Lauren, for and uh, your podcast. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, enjoy your, your, uh, your, your, I don't know what you're going to do now, but enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks so much. The cold day in Park City. It's, Park City it's, another, but, uh, it's another cold day, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thanks a lot. Music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound www.bendsound.com